Who are the criminals that made decisions that were so bad they might as well have turned themselves in? Let's find out, starting with... Number 6. The Wu Gang A group of criminals scammed the government and then made a rap video about it. The Wu Gang, whose name sometimes stands for We On Our Own, was associated with the late rapper Pop Smoke, who actually released a single, The Wu, featuring 50 Cent and Roddy Rich, referencing the gang. The Wu Gang apparently doesn't usually leave New York City, which is where their gang is based. So detectives were very surprised when members of the gang began posting pictures that placed them not only outside New York, but on the West Coast. Members of the gang posted pictures of themselves in expensive houses with amazing views, but the detectives quickly realized that the pictures had been taken in Florida and California. So they got to thinking. They generally never leave New York, but now they didn't just leave, but they also left New York living large. The detectives figured out that the gang must have profited from some huge score, and they began to investigate. The first step was to trace the Airbnb the gang members stayed in. Detectives were able to get the exact homes the gang members were posting from and were able to comb through their bank records. That's when they discovered that members of the gang had been involved in a scheme to defraud the government by filing for COVID unemployment benefits using false names. Following that lead, the NYPD teamed up with the Inspector General's Office of the U.S. and the Department of Labor to find out the specifics of the scam. They discovered that eight members of the Wu Gang had used more than 800 false identities to file nearly 1,000 unemployment claims. They used these claims to get at least $4 million from the government. The money could have been even more as the gang made claims that totaled over $20 million. The police also discovered that the gang members had bragged about their crimes in a music video they'd made around the same period. The song's lyrics included lines about unemployment making them work harder, but they meant defraud and unemployment refer to the COVID-19 employment benefit scheme. This was a clear reference to the money that the gang had got from defrauding the government. The police investigation also discovered Instagram posts where members of the gang posed with a Lamborghini and a Mercedes Maybach. They also found pictures of members of the gang posing with large stacks of cash. The lines in their songs and the social media posts were evidence that the gang had gotten a huge injection of money around the period gang members started filing false unemployment claims. There's definitely ways to get away with this scam, but one way to guarantee to not get away with it is by posting the evidence on social media. But they just had to brag. Number 5. Crossbow Fashion Darren Durant was caught stealing a crossbow by stuffing it down his pants. Because how else was he going to steal a crossbow? The entire episode was caught on camera, so it was difficult for Durant to argue that it didn't happen. In the video, the handle of the bow was visibly sticking out of his waistband as he made his getaway. Oddly, the theft was only discovered when store workers noticed that two of the crossbows in the store had been stolen. They checked the surveillance video and saw Durant stealing not just a bow, but but also a pair of cutting tools, meaning his absurd attempt at hiding the crossbow actually worked. The video was shared online, and in it, Durant can be seen walking around with a crutch in one hand and the crossbow in the other, like you do. He rests the crutch against one of the shelves and put the huge bow in his pants. Durant barely conceals it, but it doesn't seem like he cares that much. Then he gets his crutch and limps away to freedom. It's funny, but the bow sells for over $1,000, so it's not like this was just some petty theft. The police got involved, and a few days later, Durant was caught in the parking lot of a Walgreens. When he saw the police coming, he tried to run, but he didn't get very far. Unsurprisingly, this wasn't the first time Durant got in trouble with the law. He'd gotten two prior felony theft convictions and may have continued his reign of poorly disguised robberies if he hadn't been caught. How much did the employees not care, though? He got out with the crossbow looking completely ridiculous in his pants, and no one noticed? Number four, carjacking is a lifestyle. Anthony 
Jamie Goddard stole a vehicle from a jail bond agent barely minutes after he was released from jail for stealing a vehicle. The car belonged to bondswoman Namia Cropper. Cropper had arrived at the jail for some business and parked her vehicle right outside in the parking lot. While she was inside, Goddard just got released. But instead of seeing freedom, he saw opportunity. Hopped in Cropper's car and drove off. The entire thing was caught on video too because Goddard decided to steal the car from a parking lot that has a bunch of cameras because it's a jail parking lot. So not only did Goddard steal a vehicle just after getting released on bail for stealing a vehicle, but he also did it in a place where they were almost guaranteed to notice. You're probably not too surprised to learn that Goddard has a pretty healthy rap sheet for someone that would steal a car right after getting released. He had been in and out of jail several times for stealing vehicles and his latest heist was just his dumbest yet. While Goddard was yet to be caught at that moment, Naimea Cropper knew he couldn't run forever. She said that she spoke to all the other jail bond businesses that she knew, and they all agreed to blacklist Goddard and not bond him out when he got caught again. So not only did Goddard steal a car immediately after he was released from jail for stealing another car, but he also stole a car from a jail bondswoman who's going to make sure he never gets bonded out of jail again. This crime is a hall of famer when it comes to dumb crimes for sure. And it's not like no one would know who he was by looking at the footage, where you see a video and you're like, okay, there's a dude and you can see his face, but who is he? The police already had all of his information because they literally just let him out really makes you wonder what his thought process was. Number three, the NBA healthcare fraud. Ex-NBA player Terrence Williams has been sentenced to 10 years in prison for participating in a $5 million healthcare fraud against the NBA. The story of Terrence Williams is unusual because most athletes just move abroad when they can no longer compete in the NBA. But Terrence didn't play overseas. Instead, he decided to defraud the league. We've covered this story before, but we now have an update. In 2022, Terrence was busted for orchestrating a conspiracy where he convinced 18 former basketballers to defraud the NBA's health and welfare benefit plan. The plan provides extra coverage to former and retired players. He ran his scheme for five years and was in cahoots with doctors and a dentist to create medical documents. Those documents were then submitted to the NBA's health and welfare benefit plan office. The scheme was really poorly run though, and the documents had all sorts of spelling errors and inconsistencies. Terrence also recruited other players to take advantage of his scheme, and soon he and his gang had defrauded the NBA of over $5 million. As the coordinator of the scam, Terrence got around $340,000 in kickbacks. He also blackmailed some of his co-conspirators to make sure they stayed in line through the duration of the fraud. After getting himself arrested, Terrence went ahead to threaten his co-conspirators to not testify against him. This backfired spec spectacularly as his texts were used to send him to jail pending his trial and sentencing. In the end, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison in order to pay $3.1 million in restitutions and forfeitures. The incredible thing about Terrence and his ex-baller co-conspirators was that some of them had very lucrative careers before leaving the NBA. With the other NBA players that were involved in the scheme, such as Sebastian Telfair and Tony Allen, the players had a combined earnings of over $360 million dollars during their time in the NBA. This makes you wonder how many of them had gone broke to resort to this scamming. Number two, deserving millions. Ramon Christopher Blanchett defrauded the IRS of almost a million dollars by filing tax returns on taxes that he didn't pay. Ramon kept this gig up for three years and was only caught in the third year after an extensive investigation by the IRS. Ramon's fraud is unusual because of how long it took the IRS to catch him and how dumb he was to continue filing for refunds after the IRS was onto him. Ramon had the genius idea to file fake documents filled with inaccurate information and use it to request almost a million dollars in tax refunds. He claimed $18,000 in wage income, $47,000 in deductions, and an income tax withholding credit of $1 million. He also attached a W-2 from a Tampa nursing home that included forged information about his wages. Based on these lies, Ramon was able to request a million dollar tax refund and that $20,000 be applied to his estimated tax. Then Ramon got his refund and then deposited it in a 
SunTrust account. During his trial, his lawyer found this so incredible that he said he couldn't believe that the IRS even sent the check in the first place. Ramon made no attempts to hide the money whatsoever and treated it like the legal income he was entitled to. SunTrust found this behavior suspicious and held the check while they contacted the IRS to investigate the transaction. They also closed Ramon's account on suspicion of fraud. This should have told Ramon that the authorities may be on to him, but he didn't care. The next year, he filed the same forged documents with fictitious claims, and this time he said he was due a refund of $26,000. That same year, SunTrust sent him the check for his $980,000 that had been seized by the bank. For some reason, the IRS hadn't gotten back to the bank, so they decided to return the money to Ramon. So Ramon exchanged the check for a regular check and put it into his bank account at Grow Financial Credit Union. He claimed that the money came from his late father, who had left him an inheritance just to stop the bank from asking questions. He then used a part of the money to purchase a Lexus for 51000 bucks. The next year, the IRS finally got around to investigating Ramon and seizing his Lexus and the money he had in his accounts. A month later, Ramon showed up at an IRS service center for an unrelated matter and was told that he was the subject of a $980,000 fraud investigation. But Ramon didn't care. He still tried the same IRS fraud scheme the very next year. He electronically filed his return showing $980,000 in income and a tax withholding credit of $800,000. He claimed that he was due a refund of $465,734. Again, this was while he was being investigated by the IRS. A normal criminal would just lay low, but not Ramon. He was fraud maxing. In the end, the IRS charged Ramon with theft of government funds, and he eventually pled guilty. Despite his guilty plea, Ramon still insisted he was innocent and said that the fault was from the IRS. He said he felt like he'd earned his million dollar tax refund through various jobs, and it was on the IRS to politely inform him that he'd been defrauding the state instead. So what jobs did Ramon work that made him think he deserved a million dollars in tax refunds? Well, he worked as a nurse and was a part-time student at a community college. To be fair to him, he also has a commercial driver's license, works as a landscaper and a freelance DJ, and is training to become a licensed tattoo artist. Well, he was training to become one. Ramon ended up with a 34-month jail sentence. We get it, Ramon, though, because we feel like we deserve a million dollar tax refunds as well. Maybe there's a Ramon Blanchett in all of us. Number one, G Herbo. The G stands for guilty. Rapper Herbert Wright, also known as G Herbo, had entered a guilty plea in connection with wire fraud conspiracy. G Herbo lived like a superstar on funds secured from stolen credit cards for about 18 months. He and a promoter named Antonio Strong shared stolen information they got from the dark web and used that information to steal thousands. G. Herbo used the stolen credit card info to pay for chartered jet flights from Chicago to Austin and to pay for a six-bedroom Jamaican villa that cost almost $15,000. So why was G. Herbo needing to spend so much? Well, he was trying to make it as a rapper building his career. So he wanted to post pictures of himself in private jets and with exotic cars and incredible places, showing his lavish lifestyle to back up his lyrics. This actually makes sense to do since rappers have to keep up with a certain person persona to keep their fans. It's kind of like fake money gurus posting pictures of themselves with rented cars and mansions and trying to get people to buy their courses. But at least rappers aren't actually scamming people. They're just selling a lifestyle. Kind of like acting a part in a movie. Anyways, since G Herbo didn't want to be on the hook for portraying a lifestyle he couldn't afford, he decided that stealing credit card info would be the best way to do it. G Herbo couldn't get away with this scam for long, since people tend to notice large transactions actions on credit cards. So when his promoter, Antonio Strong, was caught, he quickly ratted on G Herbo in an attempt to save himself. And when the police interviewed G Herbo, he said he didn't know Strong at all, despite clear evidence that both men had been working together for years. So he was charged with lying to law enforcement, to which he entered a not guilty plea. But he's now pled guilty to the credit card fraud allegations and lying to the police. G Herbo faces up to 25 years in prison as a result. He'll also forfeit around $140,000 as a part of his plea agreement. The dumb thing about the situation is that G Herbo's efforts with his music 
career were already paying off, so if he was just patient, he would have been able to afford the lifestyle anyway. And even though it makes total sense, it's kind of funny that there's a law against lying to the police. It feels like that's just an automatic charge that can be put on anyone. Do you know this man? No, sir. Well, here's a picture of you with him at his son's first birthday. Oh, uh, that guy. Who are the people who pretend to be rich, but are actually broke? Let's get started with... Number five, Elijah Oyefeso. Elijah Oyefeso, a self-proclaimed millionaire, captivated both the financial world and the tabloids. It all started when Oyefeso found himself entangled in a heated dispute with a creditor, Dennis Ofosu. Desperate to settle the debt, Elijah attempted to give Ofosu his Toyota Prius by crashing it into Dennis and throwing him onto the hood. Oyefeso had a history of run-ins with authorities, including multiple convictions for driving offenses and possessing a weapon in a public place. Despite his self-proclaimed millionaire status, Elijah seemed to be no stranger to trouble. But it was Oyefeso's lifestyle that truly captured the public's attention. He showed off his supposed wealth on social media, bragging about his fleet of cars and jet-setting adventures. His Instagram feed showcased a dazzling array of opulence, from gold Lamborghinis and Rolls Royces to a Bentley Continental. In one video, Oyefeso purchased a luxurious 230,000 pound Rolls Royce for his mother, arriving at the dealership in a bathrobe. Another video showcases his six bedroom home in Chilworth, valued at over one million pounds. The video, presented in the style of the MTV show Cribs, concluded with Elijah embarking on a quest for a private jet. He visited an airfield, striking a pose on the hood of his Rolls Royce with a private jet in the background. Elijah even appeared on the TV show Rich Kids Go Shopping, where he demonstrated his ability to make 1,000 pounds in just 15 minutes through online trading. However, there were doubts about Oyefeso's actual financial standing. Despite his claims of immense wealth, his ongoing legal troubles and debt problems suggested a different reality. It became increasingly clear that his lifestyle might have been more smoke and mirrors than genuine prosperity. That thing he did earlier with his Prius, arguably most likely the worst thing ever done with the Prius, only added fuel to the fire. Elijah's violent outburst further tarnished his reputation and raised questions about his character, exposing a man willing to resort to ecologically friendly, violent behavior. Oyefeso claims that he achieved great wealth through his trading ventures. He insists that he started his company, DCT, short for Dreams Come True, with a student loan after dropping out of college and had mastered binary trading, making tons of money in the process. However, skeptics question his claims, pointing to the inconsistencies in his extravagant lifestyle and his recurring legal troubles. Ultimately, Oyefeso's reckless actions caught up with him. He was sentenced to two and a half years in prison for dangerous driving and weapons possession, and also banned from driving for over three years. Number four, Fred Castleberry. Fred Castleberry is a New York suit designer known for his upper-class image on Instagram, flaunting expensive suits and handmade loafers to his 80,000 followers. Castleberry found himself in trouble when he was jailed in Texas for skipping court over an eye-popping $390,000 in unpaid child support. His ex-wife's lawyer claimed that Castleberry's financial contributions were about as consistent as a gust of wind, with payments becoming more sporadic as time went on. Castleberry's brand motto, the better you dress, the worse you you can behave clashes starkly with the reality of his personal life where he dressed well but got in huge trouble. This dapper designer, once a part of the esteemed Ralph Lauren empire and a star on HBO Max's Stylish with Jenna Lyons, now finds himself caught in a whirlwind of controversy. Before Castleberry appeared in New York, he was a wedding photographer in the Fort Worth area of Texas. Back then, he fulfilled his financial obligations making regular child support payments to his ex-wife, Bethany Richardson. But then, he packed his bags and headed east. As Fred's star rose in the Big Apple, Richardson barely scraped by financially. Her children shared a bedroom and slept on pallets on the floor. It was a far cry from the glamorous life Castleberry portrayed on social media. The difference between his extravagant lifestyle and Richardson's play is disgusting, and Castleberry's financial woes extend far beyond his unpaid child support. Despite his apparent wealth, public records reveal a laundry list of debts and legal problems. Tax liens, judgments, and outstanding balances loomed over him like 
like a storm cloud. Barclays Bank, George Malafis, the IRS, and the state of New York all eagerly await their due. Despite being ordered by a Texas judge to appear in court, Fred pulled a disappearing act and vanished in a thin air. Frustrated by his absence, the judge issued an arrest warrant for the impeccably dressed fugitive. Castleberry's family, determined to see him walk free, rallied the troops and launched a GoFundMe campaign with a heartfelt plea, Free Frederick. Somehow, donations poured in, allowing Castleberry to get out of jail. However, there was a catch. A lump sum of $50,000 had to be paid to Richardson first. After his release, Fred was put on a payment program and given nine years probation. And really, how in the world did this guy get donations on GoFundMe? Did people hear the plight of a man who didn't want to support his children to the tune of $390,000 and thought, well, he deserves my dollar. I'll help. I need those loafers. Number three, Sarah King. Sarah Jacqueline King is a Los Angeles-based lawyer who used her company, King Lending, to fabricate loan applications so she could take loans from a third-party lender. But here's the twist. She had no intention of paying them back. LDR International Limited, based in the British Virgin Islands, fell victim to King's false promises, and between January and October 2022, she managed to secure 97 loans from LDR. To legitimize her fraudulent activities, King claimed she had collateral in the form of cars, yachts, jewelry, and money from sports contracts, but these assets were never actually put up. In an attempt to enhance her credibility, King went to great lengths to associate herself with well-known sports stars and politicians. Through carefully orchestrated encounters and photo opportunities, she captured moments with these individuals intended to mislead potential investors. Among the athletes she managed to befriend were Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes, and Josh Allen. King didn't shy away from the political arena either, and she managed to get close to former Vice President Mike Pence and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. She sent the images to LDR, portraying herself as a successful and influential figure in the industry. Sarah embarked on a lifestyle of indulgence, squandering other people's money on a gambling trip in Las Vegas. Estimates suggest that King amassed an astonishing sum of $11 million and took up residence in the renowned Wynn Las Vegas Resort and Hotel, where she lived for six months and engaged in round-the-clock gambling. Sarah also faced a slew of other lawsuits from individuals and companies. George Poole an investor, claims he never received repayment of a $125,000 investment made to her. Another lawsuit stems from King's release of a Rolls-Royce Dawn in 2019. A financial company alleged that King owed them $300,000. To make matters worse, she tampered with the car's odometer, violating state and federal laws and diminishing its value. King's first husband also joined the legal fray, accusing her of forging his signature and taking a $250,000 loan on their Newport Beach home. A notice of default was recorded against their $3 million property, with the loan remaining unpaid. And what about the money? Well, every cent she received from LDR International disappeared into thin air. Her ex-husband, who fled to Morocco, spilled the beans, confirming the massive fraud she had perpetrated. The once powerful queen of deception now finds herself clutching at straws with a measly $11.98 left to her name. And yet, somehow, she's still out there, spending other people's money. Number two, John Spano. John Spano rose to infamy for his attempt to purchase the New York Islanders hockey team, a plan that would eventually lead to criminal charges. Spano's association with Mario Lemieux, a hockey star and owner of the Pittsburgh Penguins, added an air of credibility to his persona. Their friendship, combined with Spano's smooth talk, made him an intriguing figure in the sports world. Before setting his sights on the Islanders, Spano tried to buy the Dallas Stars. Negotiations between Spano and the Stars' owner ultimately fell apart due to Spano's inability to secure the money. Spano then tried to buy the Florida Panthers, but the owner decided to keep his shares. Undeterred by this setback, Spano shifted his focus to the struggling Islanders franchise. The Islanders were facing a myriad of issues, both on and off the ice. Financial troubles plagued the team, and their performance on the rink had been lackluster in recent years. Owner John Pickett had been looking for a buyer, and Spano saw an opportunity to make a name for himself and approach Pickett with an offer. As rumors of Spano's interest in the Islanders circulated, excitement grew among fans and the media. Spano capitalized on the buzz by holding press conferences, donning an Islanders jersey, presenting himself as the long-awaited savior of the team. However, behind the scenes, the deal was far from done, and Spano was engaging in an elaborate charade. Spano claimed that his funding would be paid by a trust fund from his uncle Angelo, worth a staggering $230 million. He produced letters from reputable banks and a Dallas attorney, all confirming the existence of the trust. This appeared more than enough to cover the $100 
$165 million cost of acquiring the Islanders. While negotiations continued, Spano lived a life of extravagance on the franchise's dime. He sat in box seats at games and talked with celebrities and influential figures. Limousines and private jets became his regular mode of transportation as he treated friends to lavish outings, all funded by the Islanders. However, as the process of securing a loan for the team purchase unfolded, Spano's deception began to unravel. His initial check to John Pickett for $17 million bounced, leaving Pickett furious and suspicious of Spano. Subsequent attempts at wire transfers encountered errors, with missing decimal points and incorrect amounts. Suspicions surrounding Spano prompted an investigation by the National Hockey League, which enlisted the help of a former FBI investigator. He revealed that Spano had concocted an elaborate scam and discovered that he had no wealthy uncle or trust fund to back his claims. Many of the documents provided by Spano were revealed to be fake, and the individuals who wrote the letters confessed to being bribed. Federal investigators had gathered enough evidence to charge Spano with multiple counts of wire fraud, but when they arrived at his Dallas mansion, he was nowhere to be found. Spano had fled to the Cayman Islands, claiming to withdraw money to repay his debts. When he realized his arrest was inevitable, since there was no money to withdraw, Spano returned to Long Island. Spano faced a long list of charges related to his financial crimes. The court ordered him to repay the millions he had spent using team funds and the money borrowed from individuals like Mario Lemieux, amounting to a staggering $12 million. Eventually, Spano pleaded guilty to four counts of fraud, striking a plea that resulted in a six-year prison sentence reduced in exchange for his cooperation. After his release in 2004, he found himself back in legal trouble just nine months later, this time for offering to secure a loan for a fee without actually delivering. He was sentenced to four years in prison. After that, Spano was once again caught defrauding a company called First Healthline. This time, the judge showed no leniency and Spano received 10 years. Why keep defrauding after repeatedly getting caught? Maybe he just really likes prison food. Number one, the other Sam Cook. Sam Cook gained notoriety for his scam that conned victims out of 110,000 pounds by creating an illusion of wealth and success to lure in investors. Cook boasted to his parents' as friends and business associates about turning a meager 2,000 pound investment into a staggering 21 million pounds, an enticing prospect for those seeking lucrative opportunities. However, instead of making legitimate investments, Cook shamelessly pocketed their money and used it to fund a lavish lifestyle. From a luxurious apartment to extreme extravagant vacations, and even owning a Ferrari, Sam reveled in a life built on lies. Cook's mo was to present himself as a successful investor, promising lucrative returns to his clients. Using his parents' connections, he gained the trust of friends and associates who had no reason to doubt his assurances. By exploiting these relationships, Sam manipulated individuals into investing their life savings, leaving them financially devastated and emotionally betrayed. In an interview, Cook attempted to cement his status as a self-made millionaire he explained how he turned a small 2,000 pound loan from his father into an astonishing 21 million pound fortune. Cook painted himself as a financial prodigy, claiming that his wealth came from astute investments and remarkable success in the stock market. But the true extent of Sam's deception came to light when detectives, after reading the interview in a local newspaper, discovered that his Ferrari F430 Scuderia was nothing more than a well-made 20,000 pound replica of Ferrari. The officer investigated further and and discovered that the teenager's ostentatious lifestyle was all built on lies. Police identified at least six victims who had invested a total of 110,000 pounds under the false pretense of legitimate financial investments. This led to Cook's eventual admission of guilt on six counts of fraud. Cook said he was sorry, but his claims of remorse fell on deaf ears as the judge presiding over the case was shown a photograph of Sam and his father mockingly dressed as a judge and a police officer on Facebook. Cook's father, who was also in the photograph added another layer of complexity to the case, raising questions about the extent of his knowledge of his son's activities. The presence of Sam's father in the picture suggested a deeper involvement in the scheme, although his exact role is unclear. During the court proceedings, Cook claimed that he wasn't responsible for the props and was unaware of the photograph being shared online. However, such a feeble attempt to shift blame only further undermined his credibility and demonstrated a lack of personal accountability. In an attempt to make amends, Sam's father took steps to try and repay the money owed to the victims, but it was too late. As a consequence of his fraudulent activities, Cook was sentenced to more than two years in prison, showing how much a pitcher can be worth. Who are the people who risked it all just to squeeze out an extra buck? Let's get started with... 
Number four, the Kardashians. Kim Kardashian and Scott Disick have been named in a lawsuit over promoting luxury prizes for a fake lottery scam. According to the lawsuit, Kim and Scott helped curate it, an Australian law firm, to promote a giveaway that was a front to sell personal information to advertisers. Winners of the giveaway were entitled to $100,000, two first-class tickets to Los Angeles, and a three-night stay in Beverly Hills. However, when the winners of the giveaway were announced, they quickly changed their Instagram status from public to private, as if they weren't real people at all. The lawsuits allege that this behavior was suspicious, and as a result, the entire lottery was as phony as Chris's reaction to Kim's tape being released. Curated claims that the lottery was legitimate and that they have documentation to prove it. According to them, the lottery winners are only chosen by a third-party facilitator who conducts a random draw of all available participants. The company also argued that it shows a fully qualified independent scrutineer to oversee the random draw as mandated by Australian law. But that's hardly the most interesting thing about the case. The lawsuit wasn't just against Kim Kardashian and Scott Disick. It looks like it was against all of Hollywood. A part of the lawsuit juxtaposed Kim and Scott with Oprah Winfrey. It argued that just 20 years ago, celebrities like Oprah Winfrey were giving out cash and cars to their fans. However, today's celebrities are somehow doing the opposite of that. Instead of giving out cash and cars, these celebrities seem to only care about increasing their own wealth and status. We know it's really hard to believe that the claim that Scott Disick and Kim Kardashian, of all people, are really only concerned about themselves. As if they would be willing to exploit the people who admire them for their own personal gain. Both are really well known first for their boundless generosity, not their insatiable thirst for money and fame. W wait a minute, strike that, reverse it, thank you. The suit goes on to name other celebrities that are believed to be doing the same thing. Some of these celebrities include Kris Jenner, Sophia Ritchie, Kourtney Kardashian, Gretchen Rossi, and Christine Quinn. You're probably thinking, wait, that can't be right. Isn't that like half the governing body of International Children's Fund, the charity that gives 99.7% of all donations directly to the cause? No, it isn't. These celebrities all promoted the same lottery as Kim and Scott did and are all guilty of the same crime, argued the lawsuit. However, these other celebrities weren't named as defendants. Strangely, only Kim Kardashian and Scott Disick were named, probably because no one would ever believe Kris Jenner would exploit people this way. It's just not something she's known for. The suit claimed that Kim and Scott were liable for damages up to $40 million because of their involvement in the ad. Number three, far reaching. Brett Favre is a former Hall of Fame quarterback who played in the NFL for 20 years who's made millions and millions of dollars. However, it's highly likely that Favre used his fame and political connections to collect taxpayers' funds for his preferred businesses. Due to his status, Favre had special access to many high-ranking people in government. One such high-ranking person is Philip Bryant, the governor of Mississippi. Favre used this access to allegedly get millions of dollars in state welfare funds for organizations that he was involved with. The entire scandal, it seems, was kicked off by a volleyball facility at the University of Southern Mississippi where his daughter played. Favre had promoted the facility for the Southern Miss Athletic Foundation and was supposed to put up about a million dollars for its completion. A huge chunk of the money that Favre diverted from state welfare coffers went to building that facility. He repeatedly requested funds for the building and leveraged his personal relationship with the governor of the state and the director of the Mississippi Department of Human Services, John Davis, to get it. That was the situation that Favre found himself in when he decided to go all out on getting the state of Mississippi to finance his projects. At the end of the entire operation, Brett Favre was able to siphon around $8 million for himself and for the organizations he favored from the government of Mississippi. However, Brett Favre didn't get the complete freedom to just request whatever Brett Favre wanted. Brett Favre had to make a few proposals and had to scratch a few backs. That's why he made several offers to give the governor, Philip Bryant, and an 
nonprofit director, Nancy New, shares in a pharmaceutical company he was a part of. Part of the $8 million that Favre got was one $1.1 million, which was designated as speaking fees. The Hall of Fame quarterback must really be struggling. Those speeches were never made, and Favre was forced to refund the money. We imagine him grunting something along the lines of, Brett Favre, only throw, no talk, only throw, at confused school children expecting him to give a speech. However, he only refunded about $1 million and is yet to pay the interest he owes on the money. When initially faced with allegations of corruption and embezzlement, Favre denied knowing anything about the payments and their origins. However, the quarterback didn't throw that lie particularly well as he was soon caught out by damning leaked text messages between him and the governor of Mississippi. But how did the governor get involved in this entire mess? Favre's entire scheme was coordinated and planned with another individual named Jake Van Landingham, who was a Florida neuroscientist and the CEO of Provacus, a pharmaceutical company. Jake had gotten Favre on board to promote his company and new wonder drug that was yet to get FDA approval. According to Jake, the proceeds from the drug's success could make both him and Favre extremely wealthy. However, there was one tiny problem. Jake needed funding to go ahead with research and testing for the drug, and the entire project would go bust without these funds. The first plan to get these funds was to speak to the governor of Mississippi. As text message records show, Jake texted Favre and asked him how to get state funds from the governor and how to potentially compensate him for offering these funds. In those texts, Jake said that the worst case scenario would be to give Favre company stocks that could be transferred to the governor. Governor Philip Bryant ultimately agreed to take stocks from Jake in return for help with accessing state funds for Provacus. However, Bryant only agreed to take the stocks two days after leaving office. The clever Mr. Bryant made it harder to trace the stock to deals made while in office. But it wasn't enough to just get the governor on their side. Jake and Favre still needed to knock on a few more doors to get their state-funded gravy train running. The next door that Favre and his scamming wingman had to knock on was that of Nancy New. Nancy New was the director of the nonprofit Mississippi Community Education Center. The MCEC got into this mess because the state of Mississippi had given the nonprofit around $65 million in state grants, so it was flush with cash. After getting in touch with the governor, Favre and Jake got in touch with Nancy New. Their first conversation with her went well, and they understood that she might be named New, but she certainly wasn't new to this sort of backdoor business. Favre and Jake gave Nancy the same deal they had given the governor. They would grant her shares in the company if Nancy would facilitate a grant for them through her nonprofit. However, Nancy also told Jake that she wasn't just doing him the favor because of the money. She said she believed that the drug Jake was working on could help kids. She also didn't exactly reject the shares, so there's that. The agreement with Nancy knew was so productive that by the end of the entire scheme, Provacus had received around $2.15 million in welfare money from her nonprofit. Favre was overjoyed with the support Nancy New gave him and his partner, and he sent her a very appreciative text to that effect. Those gratitude texts are now evidence in the corruption case against Favre, Jake, Philip Bryant, and everyone else involved in the scheme. That's why we never say thank you for anything. You never know when it could be used against you. Despite getting $2.15 million from Nancy New, Favre was still hungry for charity funds. He believed he could get more, so he decided to get more by knocking on even more doors. The next door that Favre and Jake knocked on was that of John Davis. Davis was the director of the Mississippi Department of Human Services, which was Nancy News' nonprofit's primary source of funding. Getting John Davis on his side was a bit easier for Favre because he was close friends with the man. He told Jake that Davis was just like Nancy knew and that he could give him roughly the same deal. Favre also mentioned that Jake should get Davis a new F-150 Raptor if all their plans worked out and the drug got all the funding it needed. During this time, Favre was under pressure because he still owed the Southern Miss Athletic Foundation about a million dollars in funding for his charity volleyball facility. Davis assured Favre that he would help with the debt, but that funding never came as Davis came under investigation. Favre turned his attention to Nancy and saw if he could get the money from her. While she did wire him a part of the money, she couldn't finish. It looks like Brett Favre might have to settle his own debts with his own money because life can be cruel. Throughout all of this, Philip Bryant was behind the scenes encouraging Nancy New to get the funding for Favre. And all of these conversations were also captured in even more text messages, which have been converted from SMS messages to evidence. But every gravy train eventually runs out of gravy, and this one wasn't any different. Once John Davis got fired, Favre and his friends had to eat their taters without that sweet charity gravy. Davis's replacement was a man named Christopher Freeze, and he wasn't buying what Favre and Jake were selling. This irked Jake Van Landingham so much that he asked if the governor could exert pressure on Freeze to 
unfreeze the state coffers. At the time, funding was also drying up for Provacus, and Jake was also in desperate need of money. The big plan of Favre and Jake was to make a lot of money from the concussion drug that Provacus was trying to make. That's the entire reason why Favre had gotten into the operation. Not for the betterment of mankind, but because he hoped to make millions. Favre was more concerned with the payday he would get from backing the company and the drug than any other thing. In one of his leaked texts, he hoped that he would get up to $20 million in payments from promoting and backing the drug when it eventually got on the market. Brett Favre, surprisingly, isn't new to drug-related scandals. He'd been previously involved with an expensive new compounded pain cream that the FBI later investigated. After investigations, the FBI uncovered a $515 million insurance fraud scheme associated with the cream. The crazy thing about this entire situation is that it was orchestrated by one of the greatest NFL quarterbacks of all time. Despite having such a long and distinguished career, Mr. Brett Favre still found it in him to make one more play. While the case is ongoing, Favre denies any wrongdoing and claims to have been unaware that the money he took from the nonprofit was meant for needy families. Why would Brett Favre think a nonprofit with a misleading name like Mississippi Community Education Center would be helping needing families? It's an easy mistake. Number two, Zordon was broke? Former Red Power Ranger Austin St. John was involved in a scheme to defraud the United States government of CARES Act funds. What exactly did our favorite Power Ranger do? Well, our favorite ranger until the Green Ranger showed up, R.I.P. Jason David Frank. First, neither Austin St. John or Red Power Ranger are even his real names, which gives you a clue as to how untrustworthy he is. His real name is Jason Geiger. In true Power Ranger style, he didn't off this scam alone. He had some help. Geiger obtained more than $400,000 in fraudulent Paycheck Protection Program loans and then transferred those loans to Michael Hill, the Zordon of the Ranger scheme. Hill called the shots alongside his right-hand man, Andrew Moran, his Alpha 5. Hill's job was to recruit co-conspirators with attitude to the entire scamming operation and use their businesses for the fraudulent loan applications. Moran's job was to help the co-conspirators with paperwork, which often included forging documents and submitting them through an online portal. According to court documents, Jason transferred around 421000 dollars to Hill's bank account after receiving a loan from the government. In total, the gang was able to defraud the government for three and a half million dollars. How did Geiger suddenly think that scamming the government was a good idea? Is it some sort of B-level Rita Repulsa plot that just took a really long time to come to fruition? The answer is no one knows. Jason might not have had the most extravagant Hollywood career, but he was still reprising his role as the Red Ranger on TV. In fact, in 2020, he was on a TV show named Power Rangers Beast Morphers. No one knew that just a few months down the line, he would be morphing right into a courtroom. Jason and his co-conspirators were eventually charged with filing fraudulent applications for loans and could get 20 years in prison. It's like the updated show could write itself. Ah, after 20 years, I'm free. Time to conquer probation. Number one, nothing to see here. Jose Lopez was a public works minister in Argentina who was arrested after nuns caught him trying to stash bags of money in a wall. That's right, you heard that entire sentence correctly, and it gets better. The nuns called the police on him, and when they arrived on the scene, they found Lopez with a 22 caliber rifle. Once the police found the gun, Lopez was arrested. Once Lopez was in cuffs, the police searched his vehicle, and what they found led to an even bigger investigation. The police found wads of cash in several currencies, as well as watches and packages inside the bags totaling roughly $7 million. Because of the amount of money found with him, the police had no other choice but to start investigating Lopez for money laundering. His case got so popular that the police had to fit him with a bulletproof vest and helmet to discourage possible attacks by people who wished to target him. When pressed about the source of the money, Lopez said it came from politics and none of it belonged to him, which is a really strange way to answer that question. Lopez's explanation of it came from politics, it's not mine, did not hold up in court, much to his surprise. He was eventually charged with embezzlement and was stuck in jail for five years without a formal sentence. The formal sentence was tricky because his original sentence of six years was still being appealed. While in prison, Lopez turned into a whistleblower and went into witness protection because of his testimonies. However, it might not be over for Lopez yet. A part of the criminal code may let him leave prison early because he's been in prison for almost as long as his original sentence would have allowed had it been affirmed. In any case, Lopez has chosen to appeal the judgment of the court releasing him. The court released him on the condition that he pay a $1 million bill, but Lopez's lawyers argued that he ought to be based on his own cognizance. Being a whistleblower and witness protection, however, this may not be the safest option. Maybe he can go hide out with those nuns. Hey, it worked for Whoopi Goldberg. 
What are some of the craziest and biggest mistakes banks have made? Let's get right into it with number seven, bank error proposals. An Australian woman from the city isn't married today. Number six, luck of the Irish. When it looks too good to be true, the safest bet is to assume that it is. This was the case for Margaret McDonald of Finglas, Ireland. The single mother checked her bank account one day and noticed the bank had deposited 51,000 euro. When she saw her new balance, she went on a spending spree that was almost limitless. McDonald got shoes and clothes for her children, went out for dinner with friends and family for two weeks straight, bought lavish crystal ware, and even a mushroom lamp. McDonald, when confronted by the authorities, pleaded guilty to 13 charges of theft of cash, all of it happening within a two weeks time span. During her almost infinite spending spree in cash withdrawals, McDonald had spent almost $27,000. She was initially given an 18 month sentence. Turns out the bank mistake came from an international operation. A customer of Bank of Ireland had approached one of its branches to get account details so he could receive a 51,000 euro transfer from overseas. He was given the transfer information, including an international bank account number, but the money never showed up. He tried contacting the bank asking for the money's whereabouts. They would find out he had mistakenly transferred the money to McDonald's account. As money appeared on her account, it only took her a day to take out 5,000 euro. From then on, it was a never-ending spending spree. McDonald told authorities she really just thought the money was hers, since it was in her bank account. After noticing the error, the bank took away the remaining 26,000 euro McDonald had left. She had been contacted via mail by the bank to pay back the money, but she ignored the requests. McDonald said she ignored the letter because she realized she had done something terrible and was genuinely scared. Her spending spree included included a lot of cheap household items that made the judge question exactly why, out of all the things she could have bought, she decided to go with those. McDonald is a small town girl that had never seen this amount of money in her life. Given she hadn't had any prior offenses and had a virtually clean slate, McDonald had her sentence overturned and given a lighter punishment as it was very unlikely she'd reoffend. The judge asked her to pay 1,000 euros back within a year and perform 150 hours of community service. Number five, from Russia with errors. In June 2020, a digital banking error changed Roman Yurkov's life forever. The 35-year-old resident of the town of Tulsa in Russia found a whopping $1.3 million in his bank account when he was withdrawing some money. As an avid gambler, Yurkov said he thought the money came from his earnings and were directly related to his bookmaker's office. He even called his bank to make sure everything was in order and was told that everything was okay. With this in mind, Yurkov started withdrawing money through his bookmaker and spending it all around, executing an impressive 220 transactions in one night. On the night of May 31st to June 1st, Yurkov made purchases that included four different properties, a BMW, a Mercedes-Benz, and an iPhone. While on his spending spree, Yurkov was in regular contact with the bank and was told that everything was under control by the institution. Yurkov felt like he was living a dream, probably because it's Russia, but it took a while for the bank to notice the unusual movements. By November, Yurkov's account had been blocked. He had $540,000 left and a month later he was arrested. Given the size of his theft, Yurkov was charged with Article 158 of the Russian Federation Criminal Code. This basically meant he had willingly partaken in a large-scale theft from a bank account, because everything is fair in Russia of course. Yurkov maintains he's innocent and that this was a mistake from his bookmaker. After being charged, he was sentenced to six years in prison for taking advantage of a software breach. Number four, 37 million dollars in Dallas. It was a December evening when Ruth Balloon, a local of Dallas Texas checked her bank balance. She was surprised when she discovered she had received a deposit for $37 million. Her account at the Legacy Texas Bank went from a humble amount to that of a millionaire. Balloon very promptly told the bank what had happened. The company apologized for what had happened and withdrew the funds from her account. As it turned out, a person at Legacy Texas Bank had incorrectly entered Balloon's account number in the amount field, which led to the woman receiving a deposit for more than $37 million. Balloon did an international transaction the week prior prior to the mishap that required the bank to perform it manually into their system. By doing so, the person in charge wrongfully typed her account number where the amount of money should have been put in. A bank representative said that while the mistake was made by a human, their digital systems would have caught the error when doing their daily review in the evening, so there wasn't much to worry about. Legacy Texas made sure to keep a very chill attitude about the whole thing. From the moment Balloon made the call, they immediately sorted out the situation and assured everyone their banking system works well, something Balloon complained about. But 
balloon and her husband were actually convinced, at least for a few minutes, they had received a millionaire deposit from some friendly donor. And for a few brief moments, the couple was actually a million dollar pair. Balloon thought that she might be able to use at least 10% of the money in a donation to her church, invested in real estate, and then made sure she donated another part to charity. But in the back of her mind, she knew the money wasn't hers. After the small mishap, Balloon thought that Legacy Texas might consider giving them some sort of monetary token of appreciation. After all, they had done the right thing by informing them of the error. The bank replied with a simple thank you note and didn't send her to prison. Sometimes the best reward is just keeping what you already have. Number three, sun's out, tongue's out. A Pennsylvania couple suddenly received a surprising $120,000 into their joint bank account. On May 31st, 2019, Robert and Tiffany Williams of Lycoming County noticed they had received a shocking deposit on the account they had at BB&T Bank. The bank was supposed to make a transfer for that amount to a company named Dimension Covington Investment. It wasn't until a representative of Dimension communicated with the bank that the institution noticed and corrected the transfer for the allotted amount. A few days later, the bank noticed more than $107,000 were missing from the account they had originally made the mistaken deposit. The bank told Tiffany Williams she had to pay back the missing money. The woman merely said she would speak to her husband about it. Then, she and her husband vanished. That when the police got involved. The Williams initially said they had used the money to pay some bills, and that it was Robert who had spent most of it. Tiffany seemed to be very open to discussing a repayment plan before never returning calls. It was later discovered the couple had gone on a splurge. They bought a Chevy, two four-wheelers, a race car, paid some bills, and even managed to give $15,000 to some friends who needed money. After the couple failed to cooperate with the bank in the repayment of the money, they were charged by state police for theft of property by loss or mislaid to go. Additional counts for receiving stolen property were added too. Even when the couple had knowingly acknowledged the money didn't belong to them, they refused to pay back the money. In court, the Williams were able to reach a plea agreement that dismissed some of the charges they were presented with. But they still had to repay $107,416 they had taken from the bank and perform $100 hours of community service. For a deeper dive into this story, click the link here. Number 2. 50 Billion Reasons Darren James received a call from his wife that shocked him to the bone. They had received a whopping $50 billion transfer. Yes, billion, with a B, to their Chase account. When he received a screenshot that confirmed the highly unusual transfer, James couldn't believe how many zeros there were. After initially fantasizing that a rich relative had given him the money, he decided to call the bank. He knew the money wasn't hard-earned and could risk too much if they thought they tried to keep it. Also, they had never met anyone they knew that could have that amount of money. So maybe something Shady was involved. While the error was taken care of in a matter of days, James still felt worried that his account had been compromised. He and his family never received an explanation as to why this deposit was made in the first place or where it came from. The bank just took the money out without a word. Of course, when the whole ordeal happened, James could imagine what he would be able to do with that big chunk of cash. He said he would have helped others and built a couple of children's hospitals. That probably would have been a much better use of the money. Number one, gold member. A man from Sydney received a shocking transfer into his account that spiraled out of control and left another couple deeply affected. Abdul Ghadia, a 24-year-old, went crazy when he received almost $760,000 in his bank account. Somehow, the money belonged to an Australian celebrity couple who had planned to use it to buy their dream home. But how did it get there? The couple were told to transfer the money into a nominated Commonwealth account that just so happened to be in Ghadia's name. The couple, Instagram famous nutritionist Tara Thorne and husband Corey, said their mortgage broker had his email account hacked. When confronted about the money, Gaudia seemed to find it really amusing. Even when he was interviewed by a camera crew on an Aussie TV show, he was laughing. The man, who also had a side gig as a rapper and goes by the name Slimmy, would not say anything about how he spent the money. Gaudia just woke up one day and saw all of the money. At first, he was very adamant in denying he had spent it, but later on it was proven he had gone on a shopping spree for the ages. Gaudia spent almost $600,000 on gold bullion. He bought 14 gold bars in a span of six different visits to ABC Bullion. Over in Brisbane, Australia, he spent over $100,000 on gold bars and coins in Ainsley Bullion. He went on to exchange over $14,000 in foreign cash, as well as over $13,000 Aussie dollars in cash withdrawal. And as if this wasn't enough, he spent $6,200 on clothes. While it was obvious he had spent money that wasn't his, there was no clear indication Gaudia had anything to do with the scam that led to him getting the money. Police have yet been able to find out 
out where the $700,000 in gold went. When authorities got a hold of Gadia, he denied spending the money. But after seeing him post his incredible lyrics recounting the time, Detective asked, quote, where'd the money go? And Slimmy cleverly retorted that he speaks a different lingo, so it was very evident he was hiding something. Australian courts charged him for dealing with property proceeds from a crime with an amount larger than $100,000. His lingo became pleading guilty to the two charges. Part of his bail conditions included a 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. curfew and a restraining order from any airport. Gadia was a somewhat notorious rapper in his local scene, having been described as a creative talent that used his difficult background growing up in southwest Sydney as an inspiration for his work. He was featured in a 2018 book about local rappers. Ultimately, Slimmy was given 18 months for his little shopping spree. When one of the biggest banks in the world says it has spotted a company to buy, the finance world pays attention. Back in September 2021, JP Morgan paid the whopping sum of $175 million for the purchase of a small, very unknown company called Frank. The business, ran by a young and ambitious woman named Charlie Javis, was regarded as an opportunity to diversify J.P. Morgan's reach by accessing various colleges and educational institutions. Frank, as simple as a name it is, was a college financial planning company. At the time of purchase, Javis stated their service was being used by over 6,000 colleges across the country and 5 million students. It took over a year for J.P. Morgan to notice something significantly worrying. The company they had bought seemed to not have the reach and amount of clients they had been told. The bank then presented Javis with a lawsuit, stating that she had forged the list of clients and produced a scheme to fluff up the amount so it legitimately looked like they had 5 million customers. According to J.P. Morgan, Javis went all the way when it came to lying about the company's market reach, success, and even size. The way Frank was able to present the image of a highly profitable investment was through the forgery of its numbers. The company's chief growth and acquisition officer, Olivier Amar, was accused of hiring a data science professor to sketch out a plan for J.P. Morgan's team to see real data that would indicate Frank was a solid investment. Having struggled herself to make payments for her own college education, Javis had a strong motivation to create Frank. The stress of having to get financial aid to go to college was grueling. Back in 2016, when she started the company, Javis was seen by many as a knowledgeable woman when it came to the media with enough first-hand experience in the financial aid sector. Her personal story seemed to lure a lot of investors her way. Javis had become notorious for knowing how to tell her story in a way that would compel several angel investors to believe in her business plan. On one occasion, she stated the devastating story of how her mother would cry when visiting a financial aid office to get money to pay for her daughter's tuition fees. Javis's interest in lending a hand apparently struck her when she spent a summer volunteering in Southeast Asia. It was that experience that inspired her to create her first endeavor, Pover Up. The idea behind Pover Up was to create a platform that would teach students how to reduce the poverty gap through business. According to her, the project had 50 schools joining their network every month. While studying at the University of Pennsylvania, Javis said she had major problems while applying for financial aid. The forms were very confusing to her. Her issues with the forms were discussed in a couple of interviews in which she stated that even her parents, who both had master's degrees, were confused by the forms too. She also said that her appeals for financial aid would take an entire semester, something very uncommon at the university. They would take a maximum of six weeks. Her family seemed to have a strong financial background, with her father, Didier Javis, having worked on Wall Street for 35 years. This is where questions about her need to apply for financial aid seemed to center around. And while the Wharton School, where Javis claimed she earned her master's, couldn't confirm she actually had more than a bachelor's degree, there isn't any public information about the existence of her financial aid. In 2013, Javis registered her first company, TAPD, TAPT. The company would have served as a way to help people who are getting started in life to get more considerate credit scores. And while her intentions were noble, she realized after a year and a half that understanding the complex laws and regulations that control credit scoring were virtually impossible to maintain through her small company. So she fired everyone. 
According to her, to this day, many of her former employees won't talk to her. In 2016, Javis started promoting a website named frankbafsa.com. In it, the company promised a money-back guarantee scheme for students applying for financial aid who didn't receive at least $1,000 off their tuition. Turns out, the Department of Education took notice of the website and quickly took legal action. FAFSA, which stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid, is a registered trademark of the U.S. Department of Education. Javis agreed to relinquish the website to them. Any mention of FAFSA would have to be removed from that moment on. So, Frank became its sole name, something that didn't please Adi Amsi, Frank's then chief technical officer and co-founder, who sued Javis and got a settlement. While all of this was happening, Javis was receiving a lot of media attention. One time, she even wrote an opinion piece for the New York Times about FAFSA that turned out to be so full of errors, the newspaper had to issue an eight-sentence correction. But this didn't stop her role. She had multiple interviews in highly notorious media outlets despite there being numerous red flags regarding her business handlings. An in-depth interview about her startup at Yahoo was the beginning of a whole media tour that reached its peak with Javis appearing in Forbes 30 Under 30 list. Unfortunately for Javis, it didn't take long for detractors to appear. Wesley Whistle, a man from the New America Think Tank, wrote an infamous blog post where he denounced Frank's lack of credibility for promising help with pandemic reliefs with schools and colleges it wasn't working with directly. Soon after, Frank received a warning letter from the Federal Trade Commission stating their worries about the so-called assistance they provided, which was lacking vital information for students who were actually applying to universities. Part of Frank's offer included not only assistance in financial aid, but a ton of online classes available to registered students who had paid one of their monthly or yearly plans. Classes, ranging from $500 to $700, were said to be part of the curriculum of several universities. One of them was supposed to be Kaiser University, which had 448 courses available within Frank's website. Kaiser University had no clue about it. In fact, the university said they had no knowledge of Frank or contracts whatsoever. Another school in Cleveland, Lee University, was said to offer 317 classes through Frank's online system. Funny enough, Lee only had 248 online courses available, and of course, no one that worked there had even heard of Frank. In a statement, Lee University denied any connection to Frank and their class subscription system. While there seemed to be a long line of schools doing business with the company, there was a lot of disbelief, even during investing pitches. Frank wasn't able to publicly state which schools were doing business with them, something that raised eyebrows for many financial investors. Needless to say, it was a true surprise to many financial advisors when, in September 2021, JP Morgan announced it was acquiring Frank. Experts were in disbelief. What was really worrying was how Frank's numbers didn't add up. The amount of customers the platform had was disproportionate to the amount of teenagers entering colleges in the US. And even if many of them received help during their FAFSA, it still didn't make 5 million people in 5 years. An independent survey done by Mark Salisbury from Augustana College stated how impossible it would be for a small company like that to reach those numbers without a heavy financial investment of millions of dollars. He knew there was something fishy. Even the website traffic wouldn't have been able to reach the numbers Javis was claiming. A survey done by Krantowitz, who had filed the Freedom of Information Act a few years prior, showed it only reached 67,000 a month. Added to this, there was the claim that Frank was working with students in about 6,000 different schools across the U.S. Official data from the government states there are only 5,916 institutions that qualify for financial aid. For Frank to reach those numbers, not only would they have had to round them out, but they would have had to work with each and every single one of those colleges. Highly unlikely. There's still a lot to be understood as to why JP Morgan had such an interest in Frank. They even went as far as proposing a $20 million upfront payment as a retention fee so that Javis would stay during JP's merger. Not only that, they were in it for the long run. JP Morgan's intention was to be able to work with all 5 million customers through Frank for many decades to come. The startup would serve as a database and direct link between the bank and the young demographic they were working with. So, after settling a $35 per person fee, JP Morgan would be paying an astounding $175 million in total for the purchase of Frank. Once the contracts were signed and the deal was set, JP Morgan started its way towards connecting with the client database. Of the 400,000 emails that were sent, only 28% were received in a functional inbox. Weird, considering Frank claimed to have a 99% delivery success with its customers. From the thousands of emails sent, only one 
103 customers actually clicked the link Frank had provided. Soon after, it was clear to JP Morgan that Frank didn't have more than a mere 250,000 clients. And an in-depth investigation started by taking a dive into Frank's email account. In the midst of many incriminating messages, JP Morgan found evidence that Javis had hired a data scientist to fake data so that the bank would see there were millions of customers, which was in fact a lie. The situation was concerning to say the least. Another email conversation with one of Frank's engineers had Javis saying there shouldn't be any worry about the faking of the numbers because she believed nobody would go to jail for it. When presented with a formal lawsuit from JP Morgan, Javis then sided with Alex Spiro, a defense attorney known for being part of Elon Musk's team in another lawsuit. Javis claims JP Morgan should pay her for the internal investigation, citing she requires her legal expenses to be covered by the bank, according to the contract. Her attorney claims JP Morgan had tried to access private information from students, and when they realized they would be breaking the law and could be open to litigation, they used this lawsuit as a cover-up. Added to this, Spiro also commented that the allegations of data manipulation against Javis were false. According to him, JP Morgan received all of the information before the purchase and were fully aware of the student privacy laws that would forbid them from accessing certain data. The data forgery claims were just a way to back off from the deal. Federal laws protect certain student data from being accessed by institutions and colleges. While this may be true for them, it was unclear if a company like Frank, which did not directly work with the information, would fall under the federal law's protection. JP Morgan shut down Frank and even deleted the purchase from their website. It's safe to say the bank considered the whole ordeal a catastrophe. And while the bank has been clear on recognizing the huge mistake they made, questions have arised about whether or not they did proper research on the matter before buying a startup like Frank. There's no knowledge of people who actually used financial aid being involved in the research or if any of the bank's executives actually knew how a FAFSA worked. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to stay tuned to learn about how this African playboy is wasting his country's money. Frank's journey through the world of financial aid may be over, but that hasn't stopped other similar companies from having hope. Unfortunately, the way to help more students with their debt seems to be way trickier now, since a lot of these companies need banks and venture capital firms to help them finance their operations and reach more students. And they aren't all willing to do it. Frank's disaster seems to be the primary reference nowadays, as if these companies weren't struggling already. The way Javis built her company will forever generate doubts for anyone who was involved in the process. As the media has reported, there isn't even a way to confirm that her business references or mentors are even connected with her. None of the investors she had named would confirm anything. In fact, one of her mentors, whom she credited to have been the person that helped her out the most when she was struggling with her startup, Bobby Turner, publicly stated he didn't directly give her any advice. He was just a benefactor at Warden who was in contact with a lot of students, not her personal mentor. Who knows what's next for the drama that Javis v. JP Morgan, as the case is currently ongoing. Regardless of the outcome, Frank is a prime example of buyer beware. Just because the claims of a product seem credible doesn't mean they actually are. Due diligence is always necessary. Only seeing the potential of a thing without also looking at the reality of a thing will only set you up to fail. That's just us being Frank. Randy Constant was a well-respected and ambitious man who had worked his way up the agricultural corporate ladder. He seemed to be the epitome of the Midwestern guy, and people who knew him described him as straightforward, healthy, and wholesome. But Constant also enjoyed secret trips to Vegas, where he developed relationships with three escorts and transferred over $2 million to entities related to them. He shared a bank account with one of the women who used $110,000 to pay her car payments, insurance, plastic surgery, travel to Spain, and other expenses. He funded his trips and his escorts by selling millions of dollars worth of fake organic corn and soybeans in what is one of the largest agricultural frauds ever seen in the US. Presiding judge C.J. Williams compared Constant to the organic grain he sold because neither was what they advertised. The revelations about Constant's fraudulent activities and double life in Vegas shocked his community. Despite his positive reputation, Constant was a liar, cheat, and serial philanderer who masterminded one of the largest agricultural frauds in American history. 
Constant was one of the biggest certified organic feed grain sellers in the United States. He made a good living buying and selling organic grain and raising tons of tilapia he farmed at a former Walmart. Constant was well respected by his employees and was an active community member. He served in various leadership roles, such as his involvement with the United Methodist Church, leading youth mission trips, and serving as president of the town school board. His charitable work began at an early age when he was involved with the Future Farmers of America, winning awards for his agricultural record keeping and reciting the organization's creed. During that time, he also raised funds for charity and won scholarships. He was passionate about organic farming, often using it in his sales pitches. Despite others underestimating him, he could hold his own in conversations about the practice. Constant proved his dedication to the industry by leasing a few dozen acres of farmland and managing thousands of acres elsewhere. He was also business minded. Constant sold over 11.5 million bushels of organic corn and soybeans. In 2016 alone, he sold 7% of all organic corn and 8% of all organic soybeans. His sales amounted to $19 million that year, with even higher figures in previous years. The numbers were impressive, but the reality was that Constant couldn't have possibly sold such large quantities of organic crops. Constant didn't have access to enough organic crop acres to supply that many bushels and his prices were too low for organic grain. Organic grain is more expensive to produce per bushel than conventionally grown crops. The meat from cattle and chickens fed with the organic grain is also sold at a premium in stores and restaurants with consumers preferring protein from animals raised on a natural organic diet. To earn the National Organic Seal, plants from which the grain is harvested cannot be genetically modified and must be grown without using chemical fertilizers, synthetic weed, or bug killers. Despite the strict rules, about what makes grain organic, the verification of the crops comes primarily from trusting that organic farmers are honest and the inspectors who monitor their operations are thorough. There's no definitive test to determine whether any crop is organic, creating an opening for fraud that Constant exploited. The USDA uncovered that Constant made over $140 million in fraudulent sales between 2010 and 2017 when he sold grain that was worth half that. He deceived his customers customers, employees, and community members, but none took his actions as hard as his family who fell for the same good guy image everyone else had. Constant took his children and grandchildren on luxury trips to destinations like Hilton Head, South Carolina, where he treated them to upscale resorts. They didn't know that he had funded their vacations with money that wasn't organic. Organic food fraud isn't new, and many sellers have faced civil penalties for engaging in such activities. In 2010, a Texas farmer went to prison for two years for mislabeling beans and milo as organic. Two California fertilizer supplies and an Oregon grain farmer also served time for safely claiming their organic products. However, previous instances of organic fraud were insignificant compared to Constant's scheme. Organic farmers were upset about questionable Turkish grain entering the market as it was impacting their prices in the U.S., unaware that the biggest fraud was happening in the homeland. But who would suspect Chillicothe, Missouri's hometown hero? The town that bragged about being the place where sliced bread was invented seemed to think Constant was one of their best exports. Constant started farming land independently and working as the farm manager for an organic soy brokerage company that sold soybeans to Japan. There, he met Glenn Borgerding, who specialized in organic farming methods and suggested they go into business together. At the time, the organic food industry was small but rapidly expanding. However, there wasn't standard standardization at the time in what made products organic in terms of growing various types of food, such as fruits, vegetables, meats, and grains. In January 2001, the pair founded Organic Land Management LLC. They had complementary skills, with Borgerding taking on the role of the strategic thinker that focused on soil fertility management and the necessary paperwork to maintain their organic certification. Constant worked in the fields, overseeing day-to-day -day management. They doubled their net worth every year until 2000 2006 when an abrupt shift halted further growth. Borgerding couldn't figure out the source of the financial troubles. Their operating loan lender dropped them at the last minute, putting massive pressure on operations for the 2007 crop year. Conditions for the growing season were good, with the weather cooperating and nothing seeming amiss. They didn't financially recover, meaning their operations
operation could no longer survive, and the business partners ended their relationship amicably. Borgerding tried to piece together how they could see such a dramatic shift, but couldn't. That is, until a few months later, when a customer, whom Borgerding didn't even know they did business with, called to finish some paperwork with Constant. Borgerding suddenly realized that down year in 2006 had nothing to do with poor yields. Constant had been secretly diverting organic land management grain through a company he'd formed without Borgerding's knowledge. The system to become certified as organic isn't foolproof, and farmers like Constant have found ways to cheat the system. Tests for chemicals weren't always mandatory, and in a 2010 audit, the USDA's Office of Inspector General noted that complaints weren't always investigated and inspections were sometimes inadequate. Another part of being certified organic is annual inspections by private companies approved by the government to ensure they adhere to organic farming practices. Private auditor Mayan Cole met Constant in the 1990s when they were both active in the Missouri Organic Association. Cole later became Constant Certifier when she worked at Quality Assurance International and had no reason to be suspicious of his operation. She believed, at the time, he was doing everything right. However, there were ways to cheat the system, such as keeping a second set of books. Cole wondered if he was cheating back then and was sure trouble arose for Constant in 2007 or 2008 in Nevada, where questions about his business ethics were being raised. In 2007, an article highlighted a mystery surrounding a rail car full of organic soybeans that Constant sold to Nevada Soy Products. One of Nevada Soy's customers discovered the beans were from genetically modified plants and canceled the sale. Despite the customer's complaint and request for answers, the USDA didn't have the funding to investigate the matter thoroughly. One of the scientists who tested the beans believed someone was mixing genetically modified soybeans with the organic variety to make money quickly. Constant denied any wrongdoing and tried to brush it off as an oversight. Despite selling more than 11.5 million bushels of soybean and corn that he falsely claimed were organic. He relied on spotty, irregular, and incomplete audits from inspectors. He used a technique called salting, in which an inspection looks at a small active organic farm, but those products are mixed with a far larger amount of conventional products at the time of the sale. Constant might have never been caught if others in the industry didn't report him. His grain buyers didn't look too closely at whether the grain was organic and only cared about the certificate. They assumed that as long as the paperwork was in order, the grain was organic, which enabled him to commit his fraudulent activities for years. Constant was secretive about his soybean farmers and would explain away any suspicions about his operation easily. For example, when he sold grain to Clarkson Grain Company, which tested every delivery for GMOs and found the grain wasn't organic, Constant said the drivers had accidentally loaded the grain from the wrong storage beans on the farm. While some people were diligent, most people in the industry only cared about making money and didn't question the credibility of the organic label. Constant frequently traveled to Vegas during the seven years of his scheme. He would spend money on gambling and women with whom he had multiple relationships despite being married to his wife Pam. Over those seven years, he made at least 20 trips to Vegas where he would pay for flights, hotels, gambling, and quality time with the women he met there. Constant paid two women he had relationships with over $225,000 to work for his company, although later in court, prosecutors claimed they did little work. His bank records revealed expenses related to Vegas totaling more than 360 thousand dollars. Despite being a church leader who led youth mission trips and preached against the sinfulness of gambling, Constant had no qualms about gambling loads of money in Vegas. Apparently, Randy was a rules for thee but not for me type of guy. He would travel with friends who would often stay at the Bellagio. Constant would buy tickets to MMA fights and rodeos, booking all the surrounding seats. His friends referred to the women he spent time with in Vegas as his Vegas girlfriends. Constant would even send some women to other friends' suites, although those friends often declined. Those around him believed that he developed an extreme sense of greed when he started to make money and made so much it completely changed who he was, as if his Vegas trips were an attempt to make up for lost time. Constant pleaded guilty to wire fraud in December 2018. He was also slammed with some lawsuits but couldn't pay the judgments. In one case, he admitted to buying non-GMO corn from another Missouri farmer and reselling it as organic, although those sales weren't part of the criminal case. Constant wasn't able to settle any of the judgments with many credit 
creditors, including farmers and suppliers, losing millions as Constant no longer had assets to go after. Randy Constant passed away a few months before his 61st birthday. Not everyone believed his crimes meant he was a bad person. The federal judge that handed him his stiff sentence ignored 70 letters written by Chillicothe residents attesting to his character and citing his many good deeds for his church and community. But Constant's double life statement, where he admitted to all his deeds in Vegas, is most likely what destroyed him. His attorney mentioned his charitable activities and emphasized that organic certification technically applies to the land, not any crop. Although Constant addressed the court before being sentenced to speak of the good he had done to others in his life and the good he planned to do in prison, the judge felt his actions suggested otherwise. Constant went home ahead of his prison term to report for his term on his own, a common practice for white-collar criminals. A few days later, a neighbor noticed the carbon monoxide detector in her basement was beeping and learned Constant had taken his own life by carbon monoxide poisoning in his garage next door. Constant had waited until his wife left for work before driving his pickup into the garage where he closed the door and left the engine running. A sad ending for a man who had to learn the hard way that it doesn't take very many bad days deeds to undo a lifetime of good. We're about to ask the question, who's smarter, a box of rocks or these dumb criminals? Let's find the answer, starting with number seven, pretty Ricky, pretty scammy, Diamond Blue Smith, better known by his stage name, Baby Blue, was a member of the hip hop group Pretty Ricky. However, his fame was overshadowed by his involvement in a massive COVID-19 fraud. In 2020, Smith faced federal charges for defrauding the government of over $24 million in coronavirus relief funds. Smith's charges included wire fraud, bank fraud, and conspiracy. According to the Department of Justice, he used falsified documents to obtain a Paycheck Protection Program loan for his company, throwbackjersey.com for over $425,000 and another for more than $700,000 for his other company, Blue Star Records. The investigation revealed that Smith was part of a larger operation that convinced others to file fraudulent applications for the relief funds as well, and he allegedly received kickbacks on those too. In total, the scheme involved about 90 fraudulent applications, amounting to over $24 million, with approved loans totaling $17.4 million. But rather than using the money for legitimate purposes, Smith indulged in luxury purchases. This extravagant spending further strengthened the case against him. In 2020, Smith was arrested and pled guilty to conspiracy to commit wire fraud. He was originally looking at 20 years, but was sentenced to only 20 months in federal prison instead, which he began serving in February 2022. The shortened sentence and the number of people implicated in the scam led many to believe that Baby Blue was a cheese-eating Baby Blue rat. Throughout his legal battle, Smith used social media as a platform to defend himself and deny any involvement in ratting on others, but in a kind of whiny way. He was adamant that he could never be a snitch, talking about his respect for his ancestors and the implications of such actions. We guess the massive fraud was something his ancestors would be fine with. Then, days before he headed off to prison, Smith also posted a message with his address at the facility, along with his prisoner number, just in case anyone wanted to send him anything. Like a comfort blanket or something, we're sure. Gangsters need love too, you know. Moreover, Smith gave permission to the women he was dating to move on for Valentine's Day, since he was going to be in timeout. Which was a bit dramatic, and it's not like these women needed his permission anyway. February 2023, Smith was released after serving a little over a year of his sentence. He returned to his music career and announced that he would be changing his name to Big Money Blue, which reminded us that the blue Monopoly money was the 50s, so it seems appropriate. Smith said the name change symbolized his determination to focus on earning legitimate wealth and leaving his past behind. Also, hopefully turning literally blue. Additionally, Big Money revealed that he had written a book sharing his experiences and lessons learned during his time behind bars. A little caged wisdom, if you will. However, despite his release, Smith isn't entirely off the hook. He still owes over $1 million in restitution, and his legal troubles continue to follow him. That name change to Big Money Blue. Let's just hope he'll be able to make a positive contribution to society first, and worry about the big money later. Number six, let's scam billionaires. Stephanie Hunter, a mother of two from Spring, Texas, attempted to steal the identities of billionaires, including 
targeting Houston Rockets owner Tillman Fertitta. Hunter was buying personal information, including social security numbers, for just $10 on the dark web. Despite being accused of these high-profile identity theft attempts, Hunter said she had no idea of who her victims were. However, her actions suggested a targeted approach, as she also attempted to target other wealthy individuals like Walmart heiress Alice Walton. The investigation revealed that Hunter had used Fertitta's information to open credit cards in his name, including a Capital One bank account and a line of credit at a furniture store called Cons. The combined worth of these credit lines was about $20,000. When Hunter was asked why she did it, she said she just wanted money for her home goods, but never actually made any purchases. She dismissed the whole ordeal as a spur-of-the-moment mistake and said she felt bad and that it wasn't something she normally did. Hunter's criminal record showed several previous arrests, including charges for theft and possession of those funny green plants. You know what we're talking about. Hunter was released on a $10,000 bond, but she may face additional charges as the investigation continues. You'd think billionaires would have really great identity protection, right? They caught her pretty fast, so it must be okay, but still, it's pretty wild that she even got their info at all. Why she'd target people who pay other people to watch their money is beyond us. Number five, worst guys to hire. Maddie Rossiter, James Rossiter, and Dean Smith were a group of phony contractors who ran a messed up scam targeting elderly homeowners. They managed to make a total of 45,000 pounds from crimes committed on 18 properties across the UK by knocking on the doors of elderly people and convincing them that their roofs needed repair. Then they would overcharge by thousands of pounds and deliver tremendously shoddy workmanship. The trio actually posted a video of themselves straight up mocking John Bray, an elderly homeowner, right to his face as they replaced only a handful of tiles on his roof. The video showed the guys laughing at John and making fun of his age while bragging about their scamming and how they were charging him a ridiculous 8,000 pounds. The poor quality of their work was evident when a chartered surveyor called for by Wiltshire trading standards described it as abysmal. The repairs were carried out without any skill or competence, and it was likely done without the use of appropriate tools, or a conscience apparently. Sadly, the consequences of their actions went beyond financial loss. John Bray's son Steve revealed that the shame and embarrassment his parents felt due to the fraud likely contributed to his mother's passing. The emotional toll on the victims was devastating, and the behavior of these guys, which they flaunted in the video, only added to the pain and suffering they caused. In court, Maddie Rossiter and James Rossiter admitted to fraud by false representation and participating in a fraudulent business. Maddie Rossiter was just 16 years old during the time of the offenses and was only sentenced to two years and three months in prison, while James Rossiter received a three-year and four-month sentence. Dean Smith, the third member of the group, also pleaded guilty to participating in fraudulent business and was also sentenced to three years in prison. Can someone post a video of their first day in prison since they were so into mocking old people? Number four, broken promises. Jennifer McBride allegedly participated in the theft of Lady Gaga's French Bulldogs, Koji and Gustav. The singer had offered a $500,000 reward for the safe return of her purebred pups, no questions asked, after they were stolen from her dog walker. The dog walker, Ryan Fisher, was ambushed in Los Angeles late one night while walking the singer's Frenchies. Two men attacked Fisher, and when he resisted, one of the assailants discharged a firearm, grievously injuring Fisher. McBride claims that she was the one who returned the dogs to Gaga, bringing them to the LAPD Olympic Community Station just two days after the reward was announced. According to her, Gaga had promised to pay the substantial sum without asking any questions if her dogs were brought back unharmed. However, McBride's association with the case goes beyond simply returning the stolen dogs. She was later charged in connection to the theft, accused of receiving stolen property and being an accessory to the crime. Since the return of the dogs, McBride has taken legal action against Lady Gaga. She sued the pop star for one and a half million dollars, alleging that Gaga failed to fulfill the promised reward leading to McBride to seek damages. The primary perpetrator, James Howard Jackson, who was identified by the police, pleaded no contest to his charges and was sentenced to 21 years in prison. Fortunately, Ryan Fisher survived his injuries, although the incident was undoubtedly a traumatic experience for him. Despite all that's happened, it appears that the dog walker has made a great recovery and is doing okay today. However, the legal consequences for McBride are ongoing, since it was discovered that McBride was dating the father of Jackson, so she had a direct connection to the crime. The fact that she thinks a judge is going to award her money is insane, considering such a ruling would only encourage copycat crimes. Number three, the backpack. 
Anya Ja Pratt, a Las Vegas woman, found herself in legal trouble after being accused of orchestrating a theft at the Encore at Wynn, Las Vegas. A man reported that his hotel room had been robbed, resulting in the disappearance of a large amount of cash and valuables. The man realized that his backpack containing $50,500 in cash had gone missing, along with his Patek Philippe watch worth another $50,000. The victim had remembered meeting Pratt at a bar and later inviting her back to his room, but his memory became hazy after that. Surveillance footage from the hotel showed the man going back to his room with Pratt around 3.30 in the morning with the watch still on his wrist. However, by 6.30 a.m., the same woman was seen on video leaving in a black Nissan Altima registered to Pratt. Police then executed a search warrant at Pratt's apartment where they found items resembling those worn by the woman in the surveillance footage. Pratt was identified as the woman who accompanied the victim to his room, leading to her arrest. Despite her arrest, the stolen watch and the missing cash remain unrecovered, leaving the victim at a significant loss. And like, look, we're not saying it was okay what she did, or that he even had it coming. But why on earth would you leave that much money in a backpack in your hotel room with a stranger instead of in a safe? She definitely deserves to be punished, but the guy was clearly a moron. Number two, unsafe. Mackenzie Long was accused of stealing stacks of cash from an unlocked safe in a hotel room. The incident occurred when the alleged victim and his friends met Long and another woman on the casino floor, exchanging phone numbers and eventually meeting up in the hotel room where the safe was. But the group didn't bother locking the safe, leaving their cash and passports exposed. After spending some time together at the hotel's pool, Long and the other woman suddenly disappeared, quickly raising suspicion. Upon returning to the room, the group discovered the safe was still open and their money and passports were missing, and boy were they surprised. In total, Long managed to steal approximately 15,000 Canadian dollars, which are a lot like US dollars but with better manners, along with a laptop and passports. Adding to her legal troubles, Long was arrested for being paid adult company at the area on a separate occasion. She's now facing charges of residential burglary, possession of documents to commit forgery, grand larceny, conspiracy to commit grand larceny, and loitering for the purpose of uh, paid adults stuff. At least these guys got it half right by putting their valuables in the safe, but someone should tell them that safes only work if you lock them. Otherwise, it's just a heavy box with expensive stuff that people can just take. Number one, just couldn't wait. Three friends from Las Vegas, Prince Bracey, Asha Harrison Grady, and Eudacia Thomas Gray were arrested and accused of stealing over $140,000 worth of cash, jewelry, and valuables from a hotel room at the Virgin Hotels in Las Vegas. According to police reports, three tourists met Asha Harrison Grady at the Harbor Island Apartments nearby and invited her to their room at the Serene Hotel. He handed over his room key to Asha, always a smart thing to do with people you don't know, and asked her to retrieve his wallet with $2,000 dollars cash from his room at the Virgin. How could this go bad, you might be wondering? When Asha returned, she claimed that the wallet was empty. And you almost can't blame her though, right? Again, we're not saying it's okay, but jeez, if that's not asking to be ripped off. The tourist became suspicious over the missing cash and contacted the police. During questioning, Harrison Grady admitted that Prince Bracey and Yadesha Thomas Gray were also involved in the theft. According to her statement, the trio stole basically everything the tourist brought, including a Louis Vuitton backpack and purse, three luxury watches, two pairs of Beats by Dre headphones, sunglasses, jeans, polo shirts, car keys, a pair of Jordans, and a bag containing $40,000 in cash. Police later apprehended Bracey and Thomas Gray as they were walking down Paradise Road, one of the main Las Vegas roads just off the main strip. Bracey was found wearing one of the stolen watches as well as the Jordans, and he had several hundred dollars in cash. The three suspects were charged with burglary and grand larceny. Prince Bracey just couldn't wait to show off all of his stolen stuff. As if anyone, such as the police, were going to believe that the watch he was wearing was his. It's not like it was a Timex or something. Not knocking Timex at all, but it's definitely not on the price level of a Rolex. Basically, he was just confessing to the crime by wearing the watch while the police were looking for him. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you'd rather do. Have $50 million right now, but instantly be 70, or have the knowledge you have right now, but be 18 with no money.